Welcome to Talking Science. Professor Deanne Fisher is here to discuss galactic exhaust, the byproducts of stellar production. Professor, thanks for your time. Oh, thank you for having me. This is Trek Zone's Talking Science. And you can get exclusive behind the scenes info and first play access to all Trek Zone podcasts by becoming a member today. Click join on every Trek Zone video on YouTube. Go to the trek.zone slash support or scan the QR code on screen throughout the show. Now, it's back to you, Matt. Well, thank you very much, Ross. And a quick mention of our socials, Trek Zones on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and your favourite podcast feed. Find us, like, follow and subscribe. Leave comments and ratings. That'll help us convince the algorithms we're worth it. Well, Professor, what goes in must come out, but it turns out in the case of your research, we have clean elements becoming dirty ones. How does that work and what does it mean? Well, the way it works is that, I mean, so it starts very early in the formation of the universe. The universe made a very clean system, mostly hydrogen and helium. And then over the course, stars started to form. And when a star forms, it turns that hydrogen and helium into heavier elements carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, all the way up to iron, and everything everything that you're made of, everything that you see around you came from a star. And so that's what we astronomers call polluting the cosmos. And that happens in galaxies where you have this clean gas from the universe, initially from the Big Bang, accreting, falling onto galaxies. And then galaxies, they, they swirl it around and crunch it into stars. And then a few million years later, those stars explode, and they shoot the gas back out of the top of the galaxy in polluting the cosmos even more. And so it's a constant cycle. And what it means is, is it means that galaxies refresh themselves and over time they change the universe around them. They're not isolated, they're connected to the, to the part of the universe that they live in. Well, when we say exhaust, I think of what comes out of the tailpipe of a car. Is what we have here as toxic as that uh, on a universal scale? Not at all. It's, the, it's quite the opposite. So everything that you see is that exhaust. So what comes out of the tailpipe of a car is quite bad for you. But we, part of the exhaust from a star exploding is the atoms that make you up, that made up the planets that we live on. And so even though it's polluting in terms of, co- of what an astronomer says, it's actually quite necessary and useful for promoting life and eventually creating new planets around new stars in other galaxies. Well, until now, we've only been able to guess at what happens in a stellar nursery, but this new imaging system that you and Dr. Alex Cameron and an international team used has certainly peeled back the curtain, hasn't it? Yes, a few years ago, there was a sort of technological development for a way to make a new uh, imaging system that can basically trick the light a little bit and allows us to see fainter than we could before. Now, if you take something that can see faint and then put it on the biggest telescope you have and then sit on it for a really long amount of time, you can see really, really faint things. I really like to do projects like that where we essentially do something that was completely impossible a year ago but now because we're pushing on technology as hard as we can uh, that we can do brand new science and move into a new area in this case it was what's called the cosmic web imager on the keck telescope which is located at about 4,000 meters in the sky on a mountain in hawaii which is a pretty great place to put a telescope i love the keck observatory there in hawaii and as you say it gets a little higher into the atmosphere not making it as thick to uh, see through to the universe around us. Now, uh, the Keck Observatory did appear at galaxy MRK 1486, which is around 500 light years away. What made that galaxy a valuable target for study? It's 500 million light years away. And what made it really useful was that it is, um, it's, It's in the act of forming tons of stars. So all these processes of gas coming in, exploding and shooting out are all kind of ramped up. So our Milky Way is a really big galaxy that makes about one new star a year, which is, it's good. We don't want all that activity going on around us. We want a calm, we want a calm galaxy to live in. But that means we can't study these processes of stars exploding in in as much detail because they're rare in the Milky Way. But in Mercarium 1486, it is, it is all these processes ramped up. And so the gas shooting up is much easier to see than it would be in a passive galaxy. 
And it also means that that gas has fuel, so the gas coming in is also more extreme. And so every, all these processes are turned up all the way so that we can study them in better detail. And it's also edge on to us as well, making it a little easier to make these observations. Yes, that's true too. Because it's, uh, so galaxies are just randomly aligned uh, uh, towards us. But if you want to see the stuff that's shooting above the plane of the galaxy, if a galaxy is kind of shaped like a Frisbee or a plate or something, if you're looking at it on its side, you can easily see the stuff that is above where the rest of the material is. And that's what we want to capture with CAC. That's what we want to see and measure, which is what we did. In this paper. Now, one thing that I didn't actually mention at, at the start of the show is what elements we're talking about. So obviously hydrogen and helium being uh, the easiest elements in the universe, uh, what go in, what comes out? And are there so other things as a, well that, that go in? What goes in will change from galaxy to galaxy based on the chemistry of that galaxy, but it is mostly hydrogen and helium. And then what we are interested in is how much processing that gal that galaxy did and how much processing. So in the core of a star, in, in the sun, in any star, you have uh, you have atoms running into each other, hydrogen atoms running into each other, fusing and causing larger atoms, and eventually leading to carbon, not nitrogen, and oxygen. And so we can use the ratio, the fraction of oxygen molecule or um, atoms to hydrogen atoms, and that ratio tells us how much processing has gone on. And we call that astronomers, everything bigger than hydrogen is a metal to an astronomer. We call that the metals. And so that ratio of heavy elements to hydrogen tells us how much evolution has happened. So we measured an emission line of oxygen directly. And then we also have the amount of hydrogen we have. And then we put those together for this, for this measurement. And it tells us how much chemical evolution has occurred and how many stars have exploded and shot their material up into the universe. And I think what's incredible with this research as well is that uh, we're not hands-on with this material. It's analysing the data and the spectrums uh, that come back to you from those observations. Uh, obviously, a lot of training and a lot of skill goes into that, but what, what does that data look like when it comes back from Keck? Well, there's a lot of processes that go through uh, getting a photon from the sky into me calling it this amount of oxygen. Um, we get first... You have to, of course, with the data, you have to remove things like the sky itself, features in front of the telescope itself, all of these things you have to very care carefully calibrate out and remove from your, from your data. And then after we process that through, we're left with what we call a, a data cube. And this is kind of a new thing in astronomy. It's a few years old now, but um, it's an image, but at every single pixel in your image, like you would have in your camera, you're basically looking at an entire spectrum of light where you have a hundred or a thousand values ranging based on the wavelength. And so you have a spectrum where, uh, where each little position represents a wavelength, and we have that for every image in a galaxy. And this is, so you end up with data sets that are an individual image that we work with is something like three gigabytes alone. And then you have to process the whole thing through your uh, computer we have. So at Swinburne, we have a supercomputer that we use to process data. And um, it's all a quite intensive uh, project and in requires a lot of graduate students writing lots of Python code. Fantastic. Well, you were also joined, as I mentioned before, uh, by a research, uh, joined in the research by scientists in the US and Chile as well. What's it like to collaborate on research with international partners? It's a lot of fun. Uh, so I, I am not from Australia. I went to school in the US. And uh, I basically, when I create um, collaborations, so this project is part of an lo ongoing long collaboration of about 10 professors around the world. And I basically look to work with my friends who are around the world. During normal times, we see each other a couple times a year. Um, and it's we're all excited around the same topic. And the idiosyncrasies of waking up really early in the morning in Australia to talk to somebody in North America <laughs> at a reasonable time can be challenging. But otherwise, I'm, you know, people who do astronomy usually really, really love it. And so when you're working with somebody who's your friend, who's also really interested in what you want to do, and also they really want, they really love what they're doing, it's just a lot of fun. It's a lot, it's a fun job to have. 
Very, very cool. Well, Trexide membership costs less than a cup of coffee a month. It's available via the join button below on YouTube. For our podcast listeners, jump onto the trek.design slash support. Supporting me grow this channel gets you first play access and behind the scenes goss. Do it today. Have my eternal gratitude. Professor, thanks for beaming in for this edition of Talk and Science. Thank you very much for having me. It was a lot of fun. 